morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this really important session that we have going. Um, uh, we continue the discussion about the Strata Insurance Commissions. Um, I'm Nikki Jovikic from Lookup Strata, and I'm also the Managing Director of Tower Body Corporate, a body corporate management company in Queensland. I'm your host for this webinar, and we welcome John Trowbridge from Trowbridge Consulting, and welcome back both Michael Kleinschmidt from Bugden Allen, Allen Graham Lawyers and Will Markin from Tower Body Corporate. Today is part three of our Insurance Commission series of webinars. I'll share the previous two sessions when we send out the recording later on today. So what does the future of fair and compliant insurance renewals look like? Over the past few years, John Trowbridge has conducted a three-phase review of Strata Insurance. This has culminated in a disclosure handbook, and today we'll work through the sections of the handbook, focusing on examples and forms that you can use during your insurance renewals process. We hope that this will be a practical session that provides you, and that's Strata managers and committee members, with the tools you need to overhaul your insurance renewals. And we'll also be looking at the practical and compliance aspects. As always, before we begin, uh, that the information in this session, including the discussions arising from submitted questions and chat conversations, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as advice. And you should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in this session. So John Trowbridge from Trowbridge Consulting has a distinguished career as an actuary, consultant, executive, company director and regulator, working mainly in financial services with an emphasis on insurance related businesses. Michael Kleinschmidt, Bugden Allen Graham Lloyd, has specialised in strata law for over 20 years. During this time, Michael has acted for almost all of the different stakeholder groups in almost every conceivable strata matter type. And Will Markin from Tower Body Corporate worked as a strata manager in New South Wales before joining the Tower team as a general manager and senior strata manager in 2020. Will is a licensed strata manager and he believes in proactive ethical strata management and hopes to provide Tower's customers with the knowledge and support required to take their schemes forward into the next generation of body corporate management. So I might um, let the session begin now because we've got lots and lots of information to cover. I'm going to invite John to, um, to say hi first um, and introduce himself to everyone. It's the first time that John's been on one of the Lookup Strata webinars. Really happy to have him here. And John, I'll let you uh, talk through your session and, uh, and uh, give some background on the Disclosure Handbook as well. Okay, thank you very much, Nikki. It's a pleasure to join you and all your all your followers, uh, and I hope that this session can can be useful. Uh, we're going to concentrate on the uh, on the disclosure matters that are in the handbook that I think you've all received a copy of. And uh, let me just begin by saying that um, the whole reason that this has become an issue is because it's a it's a bit different from all other classes of insurance. If you buy your home or car insurance, uh, uh, most people now buy it direct. They just go onto the internet and you work through it with directly with the insurer. If you're using a broker, then you will deal with the broker and the broker will, um, will deal directly with you, obviously. Uh, but in the case of strata insurance, there's more than a broker. There's a strata manager as well in between the underwriter and the, and the customer. And the customer is in fact the whole body corporate represented by the strata committee. So you've got a multiple ownership situation, which is different from most other insurance. And then you've got two intermediaries, not one in the middle between yourself and the, uh, the underwriter. So that leads to a, a, a complicated situation. And it's represented by, in most cases, by the fact that the strata manager is receiving um, a share of the broker's uh, commission, uh, could even be the whole lot, and the broker then seeks a broker's fee. So we've got this situation that's, uh, that's unusual. And historically, the disclosure of what is, is um, received and, and why uh, as to the broker and the strata manager it is not visible to the uh, body corporate or the strata committee. And if it is uh, visible, it's often not understood. So this whole uh, first phase of my project was to open all this up. And if we go to the first slide, so the, the, the diagram here is just uh, to illustrate how we go about this. So because disclosure on its own uh, 
just by itself, a document that discloses information isn't always uh, effective. So what we have in this case, to, we want transparent disclosure. And that means disclosure to the body corporate or a strata committee in a way that's understood uh, by the members of the strata committee and can be discussed uh, with, the, uh, with the strata manager and in some cases with the broker. So th this first diagram is uh, just simply explaining or nominating what is to be disclosed how it is to be disclosed and when. Now, the, the, uh, the proposition is that there are eight items which need to be uh, disclosed and each one of them needs, needs to be well-defined and is defined in, in the, this handbook. And the definitions are standard. Among other things, that means that when someone talks about a premium, it should be the amount that the that the underwriter, being underwriting agency or the insurer, is actually charging to the body corporate, uh, and it does not include a broker fee. But there are many times when strata managers refer to the broke to the to the total as the as the premium when it's premium plus other fees. Anyway, we've so there's a question about what is to be disclosed. How it is to be disclosed, I've put forward a set of templates, which uh, if used will enable you to understand how the whole financial position is worked up. And it, uh, it needs to be done twice in effect, once when quotations are issued, which should be at least a couple of months before the, uh, uh, before the premium is, is due. Uh, and then after quotes are, are dealt with, then there's a, an invoice. And in both cases, the, the disclosure needs to be pretty much the same. Um, when is it to be disclosed? Well, the renewal process, as I just said, it, it, it should occur some weeks, maybe a couple of months, it, uh, the quotations should be coming out. I know that's often not the case. Um, and I think strata managers, or, uh, uh, strata managers and uh, strata committees need to be concerned if they're not getting enough time to, to look at the quotes before making a decision. Uh, and the, the body corporate, the strata committee, does need to be involved, should be involved in the, in the decision. So we'll move on from there, Will. Um, so that's an outline of the total process. Uh, if we can have a look at the next slide, which is a diagram which shows the flow of, 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 trans, of the transaction. So the owners pay a levy they, uh, to the owner's corporation, uh, and that levy includes um, the premium and any broker fee. The strata manager takes that, uh, remits the uh, the premium remits the whole amount to the to the broker the broker then uh, hands sends back to the strata manager any commission rebate that that has been agreed between the broker and the strata manager and the broker then pays the actual premium back back to the uh, underwriter and uh, you usually that would be less the commission because that's been agreed in advance between the broker and the underwriter might just stop there for a moment see if there are any questions nikki is this unclear in any way does it sound wrong or right i think we've just had one question that came in from um, nick saying the quotes for insurers are only valid for 30 days and if a significant claim occurs it can affect the insurer's renewal terms yeah well that's true that's true yeah. So apart from that, Will, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask as well at this point? Is there a reason why historically uh, commissions may not have been disclosed? Is it part of a, a sort of covering of the wool over the eyes of the customers or is it just sort of, you know, just generally how it was done and no one really thought about it? Well, it's pretty much the latter. I mean, it, for, for 200 years, commissions have been paid. Uh, to intermediaries by insurers, and uh, unless the customer asks for the uh, to what the commission is, then it's pretty common that it's not dis not disclosed. Um, but in Australia now, 
in retail insurance and, and strata insurance is classified as uh, as retail, um, then it is, uh, well, the new broker's code of practice requires that disclosure. So it, it, it's a historical thing and, uh, uh, well, let's not spend much time on it, but yes, it's largely a historical thing, but it is changing along, you think about what the uh, Hain Royal Commission uh, required, not just of strata insurance, all insurance and banking and so on, all financial services, the customer is meant to be at the center of what goes on. And this is a change from the historical uh, practices uh, of many financial services entities. And Michael, did you have anything that you'd like to add at this point? Yeah, look, it's pretty straightforward from a lawyer's point of view. Whenever there are large amounts of money being paid or moving around, that's always, it's, it's, you know, that's the honeypot. That's what you go looking at um, because people take their clip at that point in time. And, uh, you know, when you're in a competitive environment, um, it's one of the things that will be de-emphasized and that happens over time. And the only way that that typically changes is that uh, you know, things go horribly wrong. Uh, there's a Royal Commission or a legislative change or a, or a precedent case. Everybody wakes up to the principles again and they start doing the right thing, hopefully. Okay, and we did have a question that come in, came in during chat saying, what is the SCA view on this? Um, are they prepared to back this up by providing a policy to their members and ensuring a fair and compliant renewal process? And we did ask SCA to come along today. We would have loved to have them in the session for you so that they could answer these questions, but I do believe that they are preparing a guideline. Um, we probably can't provide too much information because we don't really know much about it, but I do believe that they are providing a guideline on it and it will be out, I think, maybe in the early early next year if anyone knows anything more on that or well the SCA is committed to uh to full disclosure transparent disclosure and I haven't seen either what they've drafted so far but I'm told that it's close to what I've recommended okay wonderful thanks John uh, and we had another question will body corporate receive lower premium quote from the insurer if the commission is not paid uh well, the short answer to that is is yes, because the the commission is uh, taken off. Uh, you be, you end up with a net premium, and, uh, and that would typically be twenty percent less. But that doesn't mean that the the amount paid by the customer is twenty percent less, because you've still got to pay a broker fee and a and a, a strata manager fee. So the quest the the if you're looking at overall cost, the relevant question is whether the uh, the aggregate of those uh, charges by the broker and the strata manager is more or less uh, under a commission arrangement than under a fee-only arrangement. And did you have anything to say on that, Will? Yeah, I mean, it's just, just simply removing the commissions in and of themselves is not necessarily going to be the answer that customers are going to be looking looking for, I don't think. So... They're going to have to be new models, different presentations from different companies about how they make money out of arranging insurance. If people simply think that removing commissions equals better costs for customers, that's probably not going to be correct. But if removing commissions can equal more transparent costs for customers, which might be a good, good thing for customers. And I think it's what John is trying to get at as part of yeah. this report. Yeah, that's right. To me, it's about a functioning market, all right? But the, because of the lack of transparency and then, of course, being able to compare apples with apples, you have market distortions. Um, and because of that, can't, the consumer can't undertake a, a, a process of adequate comparison between products. John's recommendations take us to a place where not only are you understanding what you need to understand, but you can then undertake an effective comparison once you're able to undertake an effective comparison, then the market innovates and goes off in different directions, um, which is what we want. Yep, yep, agreed. I might pass it back to you, John, to continue on now. Okay, well, the next slide is very similar to the last one, to, uh, but you'll see in the middle of the slide, there's a thing called third-party venture. There are a number of brokers and strata managers who uh, set up an intermediary, uh, intermediate entity, often owned by the broker, but with a, some kind of um, 
financial relationship with the strata manager where the, 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 the details can be hidden. And uh, it's anybody's guess as to why this is done. Is it to increase revenue to the broker or the strata manager? Is it to make it less transparent? Or is there some other purpose? Uh, I don't know the answer to all those cases, but when it happens, it's harder for the customer and the strata manager, I think, to disclose fully. Uh, and I'll come back to that when we go through some of the other details but there's i think i've heard there's a growing number of these and uh, they do complicate the the situation so we move to the next slide oh let me just stop there uh maybe some of you in the audience have experienced this situation let me ask that question nikki i'm sure that they are there are people out there who have experienced that and the lack of transparency um someone's just said yeah have definitely seen that yes every year here in wa um so i'd say uh that it's happening it is happening out there and people are seeing it it's something that we haven't really addressed in great detail in any of the three webinars that we've done but it's something i'd like to probably uh, look into uh further yeah so we've just had what happens to the loyalty payments paid by underwriters to the strata managers associated company on top of the commission directly to the strata manager when they generate a level of business with the underwriter mm, well i don't know the answer to that and nor do i know how often it happens uh it uh it shouldn't happen it shouldn't happen but maybe it does mm. what's your experience michael yeah look i mean this is this is one of the most opaque things known to man i can't tell you um uh, there's definitely laws in place which require at least in queensland which require these things to but I, I'm yet to have uh, a you know a body corporate uh, committee or, or member of body corporate front me and say, you know, I found out about a, uh, a a commission payment or a loyalty payment that hasn't been passed on. And I think the simple reason that that is happening, I, I you know, I'd like to think that it wasn't happening at all, but I just don't think that's credible. And so the, the reason that I'm not getting those is because uh, the transparency is not there. They're being held on to. I mean, I. It, there is, a, there is a place here for ethical operators to hang this all out in public view so that other uh, bodies corporate, uh, owners corporations can then see and can then start you know, voting with their feet. Okay, and that, well, I agree with that definitely. And I've got a, a statement to make towards the end about that too. Um, and then someone else has asked, can someone speak about soft commissions um, offers a fringe benefit to the strata managers? Oh, look, it can, it can range from anything from, uh, you know, sponsoring a training day or an education day to an exclusive, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, social function, those sorts of things. Uh, typically, they involve, uh, you know, picking up expenses that a strata management company would otherwise have. So it's, it's, still, a, it's still a benefit just, uh, of one nature or another. And it, you know, there is a line between, and sometimes it's a grey line between, you know, a good solid business relationship between two companies that know and trust each other. Um, and then there's a line that you cross. You know, uh, lawyers will always say, look, I have a referral relationship with person X, you know, um, uh, and uh, but the nature of that relationship is I know and trust them. I don't get any benefit from it. They don't get any benefit from it other than we send each other clients. Now, I, I say that a dozen times or more a year when I refer people around. Um, uh, and that's that's normal. It's okay. It's a referral relationship. But if I turn around and say, hey, look, I'm going to refer you to this town planner because he took me out to dinner last week uh, and we had a great lunch, uh, the, you know, the week before, uh, he'd shout. That's a, that's a benefit to me. Does it cross the line? Maybe, maybe not. Hey, I'm going to refer you to this, to this uh, building inspector. Um, because he does training days for all my people and that gives me free CPD. You know, does it cross the line? I mean, I go give free CPD to body corporate managers. Um, that's a tough one. Mm. You know? But the real question there is, is should disclosure be, you know, be going on? Um, that's, the, that's the real issue. Mm. And people are talking about things like tickets to the AFL and yeah. grand finals and things like that as well. Mm. Okay, well, that takes us a little bit off topic, so we might just um, come back in again and, um, and I'll hand it back to you, John, at this point.
Well, thank you. I, I think we need to, to move on. So let's go to the next slide, which is the first template. I think, uh, is that right, Will? Yes. So this template, um, it, it might look complicated. It isn't really, but it, it does go to the unfamiliarity or the unusual nature of this uh, whole uh, setup. Uh, and it's because historically, the commissions went to the strata managers in the, in, if you go back into the 80s and 90s, there were virtually no brokers around. All commissions uh, went directly from the strata, from the underwriting agency to the strata manager, and then brokers entered the marketplace. So brokers then started to say, well, I need to be paid. And the strata managers would say, well, okay, but you know, we've been paid before. Uh, if we don't get our full commission, then um, we won't appoint you. And the broker says, okay, well, as long as you can get me a broker fee, I will play the game. Um, and so it's grown up over history. This is a sort of 20 odd year evolution. And it's got to the point where the, com where the brokers in many cases find themselves giving up m most of their commission and then wanting a broker fee that compensates. So what we have in the uh, the top half of the uh, of the diagram here, I presume people can see it, Nikki, it's a bit small if you're uh, on, on the screen perhaps, but um, what it tries to do is in the first half, set up what all the, the costs are. And in the second half, state where the where those where those costs go, or in particular, where the uh, remuneration goes. So you'll see that there's um, there's a uh, uh, a base premium, including commission, up the top, uh, and that comes down. That that is shown in the top of the second section, and the broker fee that's additional to that is also shown. And then you go down and you see the allocation of those fees and charges of the commission and the fee between the broker manager or the strata manager, I should say, and the broker. Um, so th this is how it works. Uh, I'll just stop there. It's it, once you've got on top of it, it's straightforward and it's taken for granted incidentally by the strata managers because most of them, as I understand it, have entered the business, entered the business they work in or, uh, using this system and so they're accustomed to it but it's much harder for the customer to appreciate it because it is convoluted it is unusual so let me stop uh, nikki and see where the comprehension issues are if we can find that uh, definitely i guess the first thing i'll, I'll ask which is the comments Paul's been putting in there to say, does this apply to all states? So that's quite important to let everyone know uh, whether it's applicable because uh, we've got people from all over Australia in the session today. Well, this is a market phenomenon. It's not regulated uh, anywhere. So the commissions payable by the underwriting agency are, uh, are I mean, there is a market norm. It's 20% in, in most cases uh, when there is a commission. Uh, so that's a market practice. And then the, uh, the broker fee that goes with that and the share of it that goes to the, uh, to the, of the commission that goes to the strata manager is a matter of negotiation and agreement between the two. And what this whole process is trying to, what this whole disclosure process is trying to do is give the owners a chance to understand this and to discuss it if they wish with the strata manager and to satisfy themselves whether they whether they think it's reasonable for the services they're getting. So uh, okay, and all I'd say there is a lot of people are popping questions or comments in there saying that in New South Wales you have to declare that commission over a certain amount, and in Queensland in WA you have to do certain things. I think the question or the the um, point that we're trying to make here is that. Uh, that might be the case, but is it being de is it being declared transparently enough so that the consumer is aware of that that cost being in there? We've heard of examples of it being appearing on different pages, um, so that you have to kind of flip through. It appears a 
is a per lot amount rather than a full amount. So people uh, might be disclosing it, but it might not be disclosed in full transparency and it's not out there in big numbers letting people clearly know what's happening. That's exactly right. And this is why this project that I've done is so important because it is, it is in most cases, uh, when the broker does the quotation or uh, the, the amounts are spread across different pages, it's hard to put them together. They may not all be disclosed. Uh, and uh, it's just so hard to understand what is going on there. Furthermore, when I be, uh, um, last year when I began this project, I spoke to a lot of brokers and strata managers and, and quite, the brokers would usually say, oh yeah, we disclose everything. We do a very good job there. I said, well, would you mind sending me an example or some samples of your disclosure? And what I discovered was that there wasn't a single broker that did a job on it that was as good as this template. Uh, there was one broker I remember that went pretty close, um, but it was the only one. And they say they disclose, but uh, actually they don't. <laughs> so do you think do you think they believe they disclose or do you think they know that they're not disclosing with full transparency? What's your thought on that? Well, I, I, I think it's a bit of a mixture because some of them, do well let me uh, let me give you the new south wales example what what happens commonly in new south wales is um the, the the broker will say and the strata manager will say the legislation requires us to disclose so we disclose what do they disclose the legislation's incomplete the legislation says you must disclose commissions so the broker fees are not visible they're not disclosed uh, and furthermore, the timing of it is not effective because the timing is often after the event, after the or at the AGM, for example. That's when it's disclosed. By that time, the decisions decisions are all taken. So, you know, if you've got any concept of transparent disclosure, it does not actually exist in most cases. Now, there are. I'm not trying to be critical of all brokers and strata managers here because um, firstly, a lot, of, a lot of them and a lot of customers too think that if the legislation requires it, we'll do it. If the legislation doesn't require it, we won't do it. Um, but I don't think that's an adequate response in this day and age. And furthermore, we've got the, strata, the, the SCA and NEBA, the Brokers Association, both saying to me and elsewhere, we we want to do this by self-regulation. Uh, now, if they don't regulate satisfactorily, the government will come in uh, and and change it. And yes, there are there are different requirements across the states, but none of them would prevent you doing what's here. They just, in my mind, they supplement, or, or sorry, they're a, they're a subset of, of what's here. Okay, all right, Will, I might um, pass it over to you. Do you have anything to say at this point? Well, I've got a question for John and Michael. Why do you think body corporate managers and brokers are resistant to disclosure? Why, what's their concern here? Why, why do you think they might not want to provide all of this information? Well, firstly, it's widespread across the, the broking industry. We don't want to be forced to disclose. And in fact, um, they don't in many cases, even, but usually if the broker is asked to disclose, the broker will disclose, but if not asked, won't. I'm talking here about insurance generally. Now here, you've got an, another factor, and that is that we know that when the, the broker, when the strata manager commissions are significant, they are used either to increase the profit of the strata manager or alternatively to allow the strata manager to quote a lower uh, cost of the of the strata manager's own services, knowing that the his his or her services are supplemented by that commission, uh, and they they think it's a competitive issue that they're on top of because they can put the commissions, you know, that they can quote lower and still make uh, the, the, their money. Um, I don't believe that's correct because if you 
if you go to a fee basis and you disclose everything, uh, then, well, <laughs> the cost to the owners doesn't, shouldn't change. If you switch from a, if you switch from a broker commission, if you switch for the, the strata manager switches from commission to fees, uh, and there's a, an, a, there should be an adjustment to the other parts of it, and it shouldn't cost any any different. But but a lot of strata managers fear that. It's common. And Michael? Yeah, I, I think there's a negative feedback loop. Um, that's the first thing I'd say, and that is that um, uh, the transparent pricing is the per lot per annum pricing, which is the typical pricing model, you know, plus, plus, plus for various things. Um, and then there's the, the effectively hidden commissions. And so when uh, an industry participant starts talking about exactly how much commission they receive, you know, then inevitably it's a question of, well, you know, justify that money. And I think that in some cases that's hard to do um, because I know that, you know, obviously there's uh, Dr. Nicole, a good friend of mine has done her report uh, in relation to the various tasks that are undertaken to earn the commission and that's good work, um, but it doesn't always apply in every scheme and every year. The commission is a very unresponsive tool uh, and so when you're called upon to justify that money, you know, that's a bit of extra, at the, at, the, at the best case, it's extra work that you don't want to do as a strata manager. And at the worst case, it's a win Because it, it appears as a windfall game, people don't want to put it out in the open. So they're the two main reasons that I see. Okay, did you have anything to follow up on that, Will? Are you happy with the explanations or? Yeah, I think a lot of managers feel very uncomfortable expressing the idea to customers that Strata is a for-profit business. Um, and they they don't like really discussing the way that body corporate companies make money. If they find it awkward or embarrassing or they feel that they're under pressure or personally responsible for that. Most Strata managers are not very adept at that type of conversation, I would say. Uh, and then that sort of propagates a, 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 some sort of lack of willingness to have these type of conversations. What the industry probably needs to change is 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 to is to um, admit that it is a for profit and admit that it needs to be making money from the customers and that, and that, and it needs the customers to acknowledge and respect that if it's going to if they're expecting uh, good quality services in return and if that kind of conversation can happen more openly then I think you'll find the transition to sort of disclosure much more easy. Okay, thank you. And we did have a question that um, has come in, which I think is quite important, um, saying who really audits in this state, in this uh, question, it's the Property Stock and Agents Act, but I guess in any state, it doesn't have to be just New South Wales, um, who actually audits whether they're doing the right thing at that point. If there's a strata manager out there that is not disclosing commissions correctly, I mean, where, where, who finds out about that? If it Does it just continue on under the table or is there someone that's looking at that during the year? Well, there's nobody to, I mean, the, it is a market situation. There is no limit uh, commercially on what you can do here. I just saw one of the, the questions coming up. One of the reasons for disclosure is to give the customer the chance to understand what they're paying for. And, uh, you know, I regard competitive market positions here as a, total of around 25, maybe up to 30% of commission plus broker fee. But there are quite a few out there charging 40%, in some cases more. Now for very small premiums, maybe that's fine, but, but it's not for uh, bigger premiums. And the lack of disclosure limits the opportunities of the owners who are paying for this to understand what they're paying for. And that, that's the the bottom line really isn't it michael yeah look uh, from my point of view there's a simple answer and that's fee for service i mean it's it's directly responsive uh it's not difficult to do the software management packages that strata managers use can be readily adapted in fact they've all got the functionality now to record the work that they do so it's a very easy thing to do okay all right i might get you to um continue on john because i know we're um you know Chewing up through time. <laughs> it's okay. Well, look, the next slide uh, we can do quickly. Uh, 
the next slide is simpler because it's a situation when there is no commission and it is a, totally a fee arrangement. Uh, so on this slide, you'll see that the, the top line is the premium net of commission. Uh, and then further down, uh, it, you, you've got uh, sort of two thirds of the way down, you've got the a fee to the strata manager and a fee to the broker. So that's automatically more transparent, uh, although quite often where this happens today, and it's happening more and more often, probably 20% of the market these days is uh, fees only, but usually for larger, larger premiums. Um, often there is no disclosure of the, of the uh, um, allocation between the broker and the strata manager. But apart from that, it's a, it's a, you can see how much simpler that template is from the previous one, because you don't have this convoluted sharing arrangement. It's, it's much more straightforward. And in New South Wales, where the ESL is substantial, like 15 or 20% of the premium, that doesn't get paid when you're net of commission too. So there's an increasing number of um, brokers and strata managers advocating going to net fees for the benefit of the client. How, how are you defining the difference between a fee and a commission? A commission is part of the premium and it, it's included in the uh, amount that the underwriter charges to the uh, to the broker or to the customer really, uh, whereas a fee is something that's separate from the premium. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm asking because I, I think not everyone will know the answer. Do you, do you think fees that are inherently better than a, commi a commission or are we just playing semantics with the words here? Is, is oh, I think they're probably better. But look, what I was trying to concentrate in this session on is disclosure. So until um, that was my phase one report, phase two was a question of looking at the, at the remuneration arrangements and trying to uh, assess whether they have conflicts of interest and so on. We're not really talking about that today. Um, well, I'm not, <laughs> but um, uh, yes, I think it's better not to have commissions, but I don't have a problem with the brokers receiving commissions themselves, but it's the way it's set up at the moment that is the, that is the problem. All right, John, well, we might move on to the next slide. Now, uh, this, what I'm advocating is that in addition to the templates, there be an opportunity for the strata committee to understand what is the arrangement with the uh, with the strata manager and the broker, so this page here is uh, is really an information page. The first part of it is uh, just saying who's who. The second part is talking about the business model, and and this is a questionnaire, if you like, to go to uh, that this or a document that the strata manager. Uh, I'm advocating that the strata manager fill out this document and present it to the strata committee. And in this, so question two is what are the business model characteristics? And we'll come to that in the next slide. Um, why is it being used? And what are the benefits of this model to the owners corporation? Now, I don't know yet whether anybody yet is actually doing this, but I would advocate to every strata committee that they, that they press their strata manager to fill in this page. Uh, and we go to, if we can go to the next page, uh, Will, um, it, it talks about what the business model is. Now, there are, you'll see there's A to G down here, which is uh, seven items. Uh, there's meant to be only one box ticked in each, uh, in each category. Uh, and that will, I mean, it's not perfect and it's not really been, uh, I guess it hasn't been used yet that I'm aware of, but it should be, it can be used and it ought to assist the, firstly, it, well, it assists the strata manager to explain to the owners what kind of arrangement there is. Uh, and you'll see the, the, the yellow piece at the bottom relates to uh, item B, which was, remember I said before on the, in the second diagram early on that there's a third party venture in between the broker and the strata manager, then 
the the yellow bit piece down below is meant to open that question whether it deals with it adequately i'm not too sure but at least you would know something about it if you asked these questions and if i were a, uh, on a body on a strata committee i would be saying i need you to answer the, these questions and then let's have a discussion about it so i can understand exactly what you're doing for us john have you spoken to many uh you know customers people on strata committees about what they want is this, is this what they're saying are they asking for this type of disclosure in an in, indirectly yes because they don't understand in most cases they don't understand what the arrangement is between themselves their strata manager and their broker and the underwriter they just don't really understand what these parties are and what they do and when we talk about when we go back to the templates well the templates are only applicable for some of the arrangements here but not all of them and when it doesn't when the template doesn't suit then the, the there needs to be a basis for uh, for the owners to explore how they would suit. So can I ask a question at this point? And I guess it's for you, Will. Um, and the question is when we get the or when a committee gets the insurance renewal and it comes to their strata manager, what what does the strata manager do at that point? Do they just look at it and pass it on to the committee or what role do they play in the renewal process at that point? Uh, well, I mean, it'll depend on the strata manager, it'll depend on the building. Um, so the, the, there might be lots of different activities that we undertaken, like at a very basic level, it's just forwarding on the information and saying, uh, you know, please make a choice A, B or C from the, from the policies available. More likely the managers involved across the whole building and they'll be mediating the information at some level, discussing the, you know, discussing what the impacts of the insurance might be on the budget or what the, if, if it's affordable within the current finances, that type of thing. So it can very much depend on, you know, on the circumstances. So I don't think there's a one size fits all answer for what, you, what your question is. But I think good managers should be taking the information from the brokers and then adding their understanding of the building to that to present to the body corporate. OK, thank you. Uh, do you, John or Michael, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, Nikki, um, I'd like to actually uh, uh, help everybody out by giving John a quick scorecard against the law. And he's done a wonderful job, and I want to explain why that's the case. Right, yeah. So just a couple of quick points because I'm conscious of time. So what I did for today was look back at what John had prepared and ask myself the question, well, what's the law around all of this? Now, the lead case is from New South Wales, the RRA Asset Management case, the decision of Justice McDougall. Um, from some time ago now, it was 2007, the one that established that there's a fiduciary relationship between a developer of a community finance scheme and uh, the body corporate for the scheme. Now, extracting out of his honest judgment, I found these sort of five key principles to do with disclosure. First is to who must disclosure be made. Now, when we're talking about insurance commissions, it's to the lot owners, and it's also then to the decision makers in relation to renewing that insurance, so the committee members as well. Considering the specifics of the circumstances that you are in, i.e. insurance renewal or taking out insurance, what must be disclosed? Because you've got to consider the circumstances and, and the information that people need to be able to give informed consent, which is the, the ultimate goal. Disclosure is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end, and the end is informed consent. So if you don't know what someone's business model is, if someone has used smoke and mirrors to hide the money trail, then that's not proper disclosure if you don't disclose what those arrangements are. The next question is, what disclosure will negate the breach of fiduciary duty? Because when you're at the stage when disclosure is required, you've already breached your fiduciary duty. You're already making profit out of your position as a fiduciary apropos the body corporate. Okay, so as a strata manager, you're already putting money, money in your back pocket. I'm going to come to the statutory disclosure point next, which is you've got to consider the disclosure in the context of the statutory scheme. What do the statutes say? Now, this is just a wake-up call. Statutes are not the be-all and end-all of law in this country or any state, okay? There's the common law, there's equity. There's a whole body of law which travels with our legal system that you don't find in a statute book 
just because a statute says you have to do X doesn't mean that you also have to do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. There's a, there's a common misconception that just because you can turn it up in a piece of legislation and you can put a tick next to it, that you're okay. You're not. There are bigger principles at play that you need advice on. And whenever you set up a business or you start business regularly during business, you should be looking at your compliance against those sort of principles as well. Final point there is after proper disclosure, do you get informed consent? You can give all the disclosure in the world, but if the person that you're giving it to clearly does not understand and has not made an informed decision, then it doesn't work. You're back in a breach situation. I want to talk briefly to, this is just an example of this in Queensland. In Queensland, because I, I considered John's disclosure regime and particularly, you know, two lots of just two lots of disclosure at least you know before you go seeking the proposals and now after you get the proposals in in queensland there's this wonderful situation where there's actually two lots of disclosure but at different times so, can you, can you just adjust your microphone because i think some people are having a little bit of problems hearing it if you could just put it closer to you yeah so sorry about that yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so having regard to queensland particularly you know every year the insurance that is in place already must disclose at the AGM those details. So who's getting a benefit from who? Now you see that word associate down at page Roman five. There is a test of association that's really, really wide for that. So that's an annual disclosure at the annual general meeting that must be given. And then the other disclosure that must happen is when you're going about the business of getting the quotes and entering contracts. A body corporate manager is a relevant person for our legislation. And whenever a relevant person um, uh, is aware that one of their associates is going to supply the service of insurance or brokering, then they must inform their body corporate. If there is already a relationship, uh, a contract in place, uh, and say you get a new strata manager uh, and that person is an associate of the supplier, such as the broker or the insurer, then the body corporate manager has to disclose that relationship straight away. And then separately, there has to be a disclosure of a commission, payment, fee, benefit, whatever you like to call it. Now, a breach of those provisions can render someone liable to a fine for 20 penalty units, but more importantly, in my view, they don't authorise the payment to be made and received. All they do is impose a disclosure requirement. In my view, if you haven't done the extra work, discharge your fiduciary duties in relation to disclosure so that it's an effective defence, you're going to have a problem and you're going to be subjected to extra relief. So why did I mention all of that? What I wanted to do, and I'll stop to share now if that's all right, is just point out that just because statute says I must give this much disclosure, that doesn't mean that this much disclosure entitled to you to the commission or fee or payment or benefit that you receive. You really have to consider your fiduciary obligations. As well. Okay, John, would you like to um, say anything about that presentation? Thank you, Michael. Um, well no, well, no, I understand what Michael's uh, saying, and um, I guess that what that what he's explained is the the legal environment in which the disclosures should be should be made anyway. Um, and it, it, it and I, it probably goes back to the very reason that I was asked to look at this in the first place by um, by Robert Kelly at Steadfast because he, being a, a major player in the underwriting and uh, broking field, steadfast, uh, he is uh, concerned that if all these things that Michael's talking about and that I'm talking about are not dealt with, then sooner or later it's going to it's going to backfire on the strata management industry and or the broking industry. And that's really why this should be done. And it's in the context too of the emerging environment after Commissioner Hain, where, as I said earlier on, the, the consumer has become 
recognised as the as the key player in every um, financial services transaction. So you know, there's a whole environment here, if you like, or ecosystem where this direction is the direction we have to go. And I'm pretty sure that while it's taking a little time to get it all to happen, um, I think it will happen. Okay, that's great, nice and positive. And Will? Yeah, I've got, a, I've got another question for John and Michael, but is disclosure an end game in itself, do you think? Is it sufficient or is it? Uh, in my mind, it's not at the end game. The end game is to, I mean, it's a it's a critical game because uh, owners do not really understand, or few owners understand enough about what's going on here. But once they do, then it raises what's what I've talked about in phase two, which is conflicts of interest, uh, and that I think aligns with uh, Michael's interest in fiduciary obligations as well. So once customers understand what, what's going on, then they're in a position to have a de debate. Um, and unless, re unless legislation intervenes, it'll be simply a matter between owners, or owners corporations and their strata committees on the one hand, and their strata managers and perhaps their brokers on the other hand. And Michael? Yeah, I, I think that John's disclosure done properly will be a transitional phase um, because once there is uh, more transparency in the market and so different products can arise and different approaches to the problem can be proposed uh, and strata managers have different business models um, to do with this issue and I think that we'll see uh, some different outcomes now my best guess around that is that we'll end up with a fee-for-service model in relation to insurance work I'm still not comfortable with that um, uh, unless that fee-for-service is being paid by the body corporate and nobody else, because it's work done by the body corporate servant, the strata manager, for the benefit of the body corporate. So that's the appropriate outcome from my point of view. And I just want to add at this point in time, I want, I want to give the participants a couple of practical tips. If you're a member of an owner's corporation, an executive committee or a committee, uh, or indeed just an owner, I would propose to you that there's two things that you should ask for whenever your strata manager's contract is going to be renewed or you're looking for adaptation for new contracts, you are allowed to negotiate special conditions. You can ask for special conditions. And the two special conditions arising out of today um, that I would put forward would be, first of all, that the uh, strata manager has to use the Trowbridge disclosure model. Um, and some, you can draft that up. And the second thing is that I would insist upon the strata manager providing to the executive committee at least a copy of any and all communications with brokers or insurers in relation to policies and renewals. Start with a little bit of sunshine. Uh, and those of you who saw uh, my participation earlier in relation to the pledge, I'd throw that one in as well to make sure that there are, more generally speaking, no kickbacks or inappropriate payments, et cetera, as well. So that's a, it's, a, it's a practical uh, recommendation for what people can do to make this happen, because it needs to happen. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, um, everybody, for the session. I'd just like to say that we know that there are bad actors out there. We've spoken about them as we've talked about insurance commissions um, across the three sessions. Um, and I guess they know what they're doing and they're probably not going to be swayed by conversations like this that we're having. Um, but I think we have um, a bit more power than we think we possibly have um, and to make change out there. And so if you are a committee member, um, and I've put a challenge forward previously as well, Michael did one and then I, did, I put a challenge forward to the lot owners and committee members to say please look at the contract compare the numbers and that's all of the numbers um, we have a WA document that was prepared by Kylie Nelson from Ion Property Inspection that provides you with a comparison table for strata management tender the tender process and I will share the link with you um, note that it's for WA but you should be able to get an idea from that as to, to how you can move forward with it and that way you can vote with your feet and look for a company out there a strata manager that better aligns with your owner's 
corporation or your body corporate's needs. And then for strata managers out there too, I'd like to say that if you're working for a company that has policies around strata insurance and you're not, and you have, you're questioning those policies and you're not comfortable having conversations with your committee, are you in the right place? And, and maybe you need to look at that and look at a, a company that's actually doing the right thing out there. So I'll leave that thought with our audience, but I'd like to say, um, yeah, if any, you've got any wrap up thoughts, I'll, I'll pass it to the three of you. So John, first, do you have any wrap up thoughts at this point? I'll just add one thing that extends what Michael said at the end. Another part of my disclosure handbook is, is the process uh, that, that should be gone through uh, with quotes and with uh, with invoices, which uh, is aimed at ensuring that the, that the strata committee sees what's going on at each stage of the process. And at the moment, there's a most cases that the the, uh, the brokers, for example, do not know what information has gone to the owners. So that you know, I'm I'm fully aligned with Michael there, and it's in the disclosure handbook that I something like 13 or 14 steps, and I'd advocate that anybody looking uh, goes to the re that part of the disclosure handbook. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, John. And we'll send, I put the link in the chat, but we will send the link out this afternoon with the recording of the session so you can get access to the handbook. I think we sent the link out when we sent um, an invite out this morning and I noticed quite a few people have clicked on it and downloaded it today before the session. But if you haven't done that, we'll certainly make that available for you. So thank you. Thank you very much, John, for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you on. My pleasure. Thanks, Nikki. And Michael, I'll jump to you next um, just to wrap up anything that you've got. Yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up with this. Um, I call upon SCA National, every state branch, uh, as leaders in this field to adopt John's recommendations in relation to disclosure without further delay in full and without modification. I also call upon them to modify their standard form agreement, if they have one, uh, to accommodate it. Uh, and Finally, that there should be a review of the effectiveness of it conducted uh, in a transparent way and with data provided back to John, if he's still available in say three weeks' time, so that we can see how this is performed. Because at the end of the day, consumers are all of our clients, and without a, a healthy sector, um, we don't get to do what we love doing. So I try that challenge out there. Let's see what happens. Thank you. Okay, and Will? Um, sure, John, I'd like to just say thanks for all the work that you've done on this. And I think the report's pretty good, broadly uncontroversial. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident that most of the recommendations will be adapted. Uh, it might take a little bit of time during a transition period, but I expect most of the recommendations will be in place uh, across most of the industry in the next 12 or 18 months or so. Um, for owners out there, I would say be don't be afraid of having a conversation with your strata manager. If you can have a mature, honest conversation with your manager, that's probably a good thing. And if you're finding that you're not getting clear answers and open information, then you know you probably might want to rethink that relationship. Definitely. All right, that's wonderful. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for joining us, um, the audience. It was really great to have you here. If you gained value from this video, please hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're looking for information about parking, strata insurance, defects and more, head over to lookupstrata.com.au or sign up to our free weekly newsletter via the link in the description box below.